passionate about his music. He knows what he wants. He knows how to get it. Um, and I, th I think he's going to go places. I think Brian's music, given the chance, will find a lot of homes and get into a lot of hearts. Pretty much early on, he, he had something happening as a, as a good pop songwriter. Um, extremely catchy melodies, good riffs, um, basic ingredients for good pop. I met Brian through uh, somebody who was working in the same building as me, who was uh, editing, and had a friend who needed some studio time and wanted to do an EP, which was Start Again. Uh, I think it would have been at the Vic on the Park Hotel that I first met Brian. Um, I think it was an earlier outfit of his, uh, more than likely Adeline. I got sent a demo of Brian's first band, Hazy Jane, uh, a few years before sort of coming into contact with Brian. Um, they had two or three lead singers and songwriters and I remember thinking that Brian's songs were clearly the standout um, songs on that. I was just a typical mid-90s teenage kid. I was in a few garage bands, a few little other bands of that kind and um, yeah, I went on to a few power, power pop punk bands when I was younger and uh, went solo. Um, under the name Adeline in uh, 2001. I think right now I, I love being a solo artist because um, you're in control of everything, you're in control of your destiny uh, and you dictate where, you, where your career or where your music's gonna go and uh, I think to me that's a, a very satisfying experience. All the bells and whistles came about after I uh, split with my last band, Hazy Jane. Um, previous to Hazy Jane, I was playing under Adeline, and uh, that was my pseudonym. But this time around, I thought, yeah, I thought I'd take a punt and play under my name. I had a bunch of songs left behind from my Adeline and Hazy Jane days, and I, um, yeah, and I wrote a few more, and I brought in, I wrote to Michael Carpenter, and um, he liked them. Yeah, I just took a leap of faith and recorded the songs, and didn't really have any high expectations. And, uh, did them in a space of uh, two or three months, spaced out obviously, and um, yeah, out came all the bells and whistles. Michael said that I'd probably really like what was coming out of the studio, and Brian was looking for a label, but didn't sort of think anything more of it until the package arrived from Brian in the mail. Uh, I remember the label was doing it tough then and we didn't really have any funds to sign a new band. So I almost subconsciously hoped that the record wouldn't be any good, but immediately putting into the CD player jumped out at me and I fell in love with it. So I had to contact Brian and discuss the release. Mark Carpenter was the producer. He's a power pop extraordinaire. Great guy to work with and I really enjoyed working on the album with him. Uh, also, I had Brian Crouches in my band now. Michael McGinty is still in the band. The other guys who played on it are uh, Jason Walker, of course, who's in the band too, and um, and a few other guest musicians. Yeah, I got signed by uh, Pop Boomerang Records, uh, a label based in Melbourne by Scott Thurling. And um, yeah, he signed me up just before I was about to release it, so that was really great timing. And uh, a few months later, um, I think it was through MySpace, uh, Pablo Carrera from Rock Indiana Records in Spain also heard the record and next thing you know I'm signed to a, a label in Spain so. The overseas mail orders and the overseas radio stations and print media just really connected with Brian's music and we sold them much more overseas than we did in Australia which I, I had expected. We sold enough records to make it uh, viable for me to do a small tour so um, yeah next thing you know we're 
it was about six months in the planning and uh, and we had a, sh a small uh, itinerary set up in, uh, in November last year, 2007, I flew up to uh, Madrid and we started this little amazing adventure that we had over there. Hello oh, boys, Wait. on the eve of the tour, how are we feeling? <laughs> Fucking excellent. I know you're a bit drunk, that's why you're excellent. No, I'm feeling excellent because I'm in one of the greatest cities, cities in the in world. The, world. the best host too. Can't argue, great, great guys. Man, we're, we're, I'm great. stoked with the guys we're with. And I played with some uh, amazing people in my band. Uh, one was uh, Charlie Bautista. He played drums and sang. And uh, another guy was uh, Santi Campos, who also was the, uh, the tour manager at the same time, as well as the rhythm guitarist. So, um, how do we feel about the tour so far? Sucks. Yeah. Sucks. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not bad, but... Uh, Brian uh, was great because he spoke Spanish, so he was also going to be my translator for a lot of the times we were around. It's más o menos a los dos y media en la mañana. <laughs> Okay, so we're in some little town on the way to uh, Barcelona. Setting up. <laughs> it's a great venue. We only played four shows, but in terms of the the, uh, the actual shows themselves, and uh, to go there and know that your music is actually loved and it's actually known by the uh, the music public in Spain was well, the indie public and uh, indie music public there was a real fantastic thing for me to experience. They screamed the words out at me, uh, they knew the songs. After Spain, uh, I had about a day to recover, to say goodbye to everyone, and I uh, had a flight that morning to, to New York. Uh, I left Madrid in the morning, arrived in New York at about 8.30 that night, and I went straight to Brooklyn to rehearse and meet the, uh, these, my new two band members, which I've, I've, never, who I've never met before. I've only uh, met them, spoke to them by email through MySpace. And uh, once uh, Jimmy M. Surian, another, uh, another guy called James Prestons, and uh, we rehearsed that night, I was pretty bloody jet lagged. We got together again the next day and uh, then we played a show uh, at this venue uh, called The Bagot Inn up in uh, Lower Manhattan. And that was, uh, it became a great show. It was part of the International Pop Overthrow Festival. Getting to play a show with my good friend Joel. Uh, and I played to a lot of new people. That was a great experience in itself. I'm going to call up a very special guest to the stage now. He's going to play some songs as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my very good friend and uh, a musical partner. His name is Brian Estepar. Aussie, Aussie guys running amok in the middle of Jersey. That, that was just a highlight for me and, and a great way to end the tour. I 
wanted to produce the album this time myself, mainly because I, I feel like I had the whole vision in my head. I feel like I knew exactly what I wanted. I felt a lot better equipped this time around as opposed to all the bells and whistles. I didn't want it to be an all the bells, bells and whistles part two. I wanted it to be an album on its own and a reflection of where I am now as a musician, as a songwriter. Uh, the same people in the band uh, were playing, played in the album again, so uh, now it was great because now we actually feel like a band. So I had uh, Brian Crash on keyboards, I had uh, Scott Barr play bass, um, and I had a lot of assorted guests, a lot of friends come in. Someone was here and I was right. there and someone was there. It's all a bit... Dan Nash is a, a great engineer, great producer in his own right. We, we worked together on my first proper release, Start Again. Came to me with a bunch of songs and I said, you know, let's do it and here we are. And he brought a lot of great ideas to the plate. Like it wasn't a major issue but you definitely heard it, you know what I mean? Like I think you went to the hats and then went straight back to the ride or something like for a... I think that was deliberate. I think you sort of halved it, didn't you? Yeah, it was deliberate. It's fine. <laughs> uh, for this record, we, we wanted, again, we wanted to get some of the old school sound into it, and the best way to do that is to record on, on tape. It's good that it's a lot more emphasis on the last time again. The very last time. So we recorded um, the drums and bass on, uh, on two inch analog tape which produced such an amazingly warm uh, and huge, surprisingly huge drum sound and bass sound. Once we had that bass, uh, it made things so much easier and it got closer to what we were hearing in our heads. The songs are really starting to take a really lush, warm, wooden sound. And I wanted to write uh, just good melodic pop songs again. and. Um, but again, stamped in my own songwriting style. I am extremely happy with this new record though. I feel like it encapsulates me best right now. It encapsulates me as a songwriter right now. I love, I love what Dan Nash and myself have done with it. The songs, I feel like my strongest songs, some of my strongest songs so far. I'm just very excited to, uh, to get it out there to the public, to, um, to have everyone hear it because I'm, I'm very proud of this record and, uh, and I think it's, I hope it just it escalates onto something further. <laughs> That's all good, mofos. It's done.